another solution spotlight. And this one comes to you from two colleagues at Jacobs, an international technical professional services firm advising clients around the world on their climate change and health strategies. Jane Blake directs Jacobs Global Health Security Practice and Gabrielle Sobel is the Program Manager for Health Climate Response. Jane and Gabrielle will jointly present two sides of one coin. What does it mean to reimagine healthcare resilience even as we develop better roadmaps to net zero? Please welcome Jane and Gabrielle. Good afternoon, distinguished guests and colleagues. We are just thrilled to be here today with you uh, discussing all of these pressing issues that I think collectively we are all passionate about solving. So first wanna thank you, Kelly, and the summit organizers for convening us here today. Um, I'm excited about what I've heard already this morning and I can't wait for the rest of the week. So together with Gabrielle, um, we are here today to discuss two solutions um, that our company is utilizing to mitigate climate change with our partners. Uh, the first, um, excuse me, I think that I might be hitting the microphone here. Um, the first a solution we'll be talking about uh, addresses the immediate impact of climate change by using a health systems resilience approach. Um, the other charts a path uh, to reduce carbon to footprint across the healthcare, healthcare industry, which we heard a little bit about already this morning. Um, I wanted to point out one thing that Dr. Romanello said that I hope resonates when you see our presentation today is that the lower and middle income countries shouldn't be doing adaptation alone, um, and that higher income countries shouldn't be the only ones doing mitigation. So with that, I will push over to my next slide if I can make sure this works. Okay. So. Can't move. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Okay, wonderful. Okay, so I hope this will keep you entertained before we head out to lunch. Um, I wanted to show this beautiful picture, uh, which when I look at, it makes me want to go on vacation to a five-star resort. Um, it makes me want to go snorkeling or maybe just sit by the beach. It also looks like the beautiful islands that we flew over on the way to, to come to this beautiful place, Abu Dhabi. So indeed, this is actually the Republic of Kiribati, which is a small island nation that sits in the center of the Pacific Ocean. Its permanent population is about 120,000 people, most of which live on one island called South Tawara, which is its main island. So over 80% of the population in Kiribati uh, works in fishing or uh, agriculture. So what you're looking at is not actually a fancy resort. It's the main hospital on the island of Kiribati. Um, it is called uh, Tungaro, and it's one of two hospitals that sit on South Tawara. The other one is called Betio. Tungaro has 120 beds and Betio has 10. So you might be wondering why I'm showing you this picture. It's not just to keep you here before you go to lunch. Um, I'm showing you this because this aerial picture doesn't show the whole story. So this is reality in Carabas. Um, what you're seeing here on the left is a picture from 2018 of the seawall in front of the same hospital that you looked at in that first picture. The one on the right is in 2022 where you see that wall is entirely breached. So in reality, Kiribati, like many lower and middle income countries, are, is greatly affected already by climate change. Um, in fact, it's considered one of the most vulnerable in, in the world to climate change. So it's also one of the poorest countries in the world and its population density in the island where the two hospitals sit is comparable to Singapore or Hong Kong. Hong Kong. So you can imagine it's fairly overcrowded. So let me go to my next picture. So you can see from this picture here, um, the change in the status of the coastline in Kiribati from 20, uh, sorry, uh, 1989 to 2012. So you can see already that the shoreline is changing and that's just continuing to happen. Now, as you can imagine, these climate issues have already affected all aspects of life in Kiribati. Everything from 
farming, agriculture, to the social fabric of the community. So you couple this with overcrowding, you can imagine that there are a fair amount of public health issues in Kiribati. They include high infant mortality, malnutrition, mental illness, domestic violence, and communicable diseases. Given these challenges that Kiribati is facing and the climate-related challenges um, that are related, that are shared by many lower and middle income countries across the world, what can, we, what can we do now to improve population health amidst living through climate change impacts immediately, but also with an eye to the long-term goals? So my colleague Nino already introduced this framework earlier, but I just wanted to touch on it here as well. Um, but before I discuss it, I want to um, acknowledge that the government of Kiribati has already committed a lot to climate change uh, mitigation, um, to include signing the Paris Agreement in 2016. So as a result of those commitments, they have already focused themselves on the use of renewable energy, improving energy security, and reducing their own greenhouse gas emissions. So our project in Kiribati, which we started in 2018, as I mentioned, and it remains ongoing, includes master planning for infrastructure, enhancements at the two hospitals, um, and is funded by the government of New Zealand. So while those infrastructure needs are, are immediate, um, we also worked with our partners to apply this resiliency framework to ensure that all aspects of their social fabric are addressed to include an analysis of their clinical service requirements. Simply put, in, in our project in Kiribati, environmental, social, and governance factors are, are key aims and resilience is at the core. So we did this by applying our resilience framework to the project um, to ensure that everything, not just the infrastructure, was addressed. Nina already discussed the definition of health systems resilience, but I think it begs saying again here. So it's the capacity of a system to absorb, adapt, anticipate, and transform when exposed to external threats and still remain controlled over its primary objectives and functions. So as you can see, we organize this framework into eight core competencies. And as Nina already mentioned, this is underpinned by WHO and our Canadian uh, partners uh, thought, uh, as well as many others. So while today I'm discussing Kiribati, we apply this framework um, in all of our healthcare projects, especially those related to governance, operations, and infrastructure, and we found that it's very useful to be a common way to look at every project that we do. So how was resilience applied in Kiribati? This picture that you're looking at right now is the future rendering of the Tungaro Hospital. Um, through this project, we needed to make sure that the immediate needs, public health needs of the people on Kiribati were addressed while we fixed the hospitals themselves. So here I'm showing Tungaro. We actually first worked on Betio. So through our resilience framework, we determined that the most immediate need for Kiribati was maternal and child care child health care, so we advised them to first reconstruct the Betio Hospital inland so that they could continue to pro provide those services while we get Tungaro Hospital going. Indeed, in Kiribati, rather than jumping right into the large hospital, they chose to focus on their key health priorities, which are those that I just discussed. So when it's complete, the new Tungaro Hospital will support the existing health system across the island with a new emergency department, birthing rooms, maternity and children's care wards, an imaging department, and outpatient services. So the factors that we put, made sure were part of this project and are, have climate resilience and health resilience at their core are central to its design. So first, the hospitals will have raised ground levels to mitigate flooding from sea rise, especially that's predicted in the coming decades. Second, rainwater will be harvested from the large roofs to combat the drought that is very common in Kiribati. And we heard about drought earlier from Dr. Romanello as well. Passive solar design and strategic landscape planning will provide a cooler microclimate against the perpetually hot year-round temperatures, which as we heard today, we are still worried that those are gonna continue to rise. 
contrary to traditional hospital design as well, um, we'll be using naturally vent natural ventilation to ensure the, the cool temperatures in the hospital. Finally, it includes food gardens to ensure food, food security on the island. So throughout the design process, we ensured that the clinical groups were engaged so that we were making sure that all the services that were going to be provided were culturally sensitive. So as you can imagine, it's very expensive, and I think we've heard that several times already today, and I'm sure we'll hear it over the next few, to make health systems resilient to climate change. And every country, system, and government will have its own challenges to address. But we have found that our framework, again, is a repeatable way for us to look at this problem. So I'd like to end here today, my portion of this talk, on the discussion of health resilience with one final point, which we've heard already twice today, and I'm sure we'll hear it again, which is that the healthcare sector is one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions, accounting for 4.5% globally. So while we just discussed health systems resilience in the context of Kiribati and how other low and middle income countries are, are addressing it, we, we must also acknowledge this paradox that while climate change itself negatively impacts public health globally, healthcare systems themselves are one of the major contributors of the carbon that started it in the first place. So to address this contradiction and flip the coin to the other side, I'm going to turn over to my colleague, Gabrielle Sabel, to discuss how the healthcare sector is utilizing net zero roadmaps to reduce their carbon emissions. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. <laughs> Hi, folks. I'm Gabrielle Sobel, and I am the Climate Response Program Manager for our health market at Jacobs. It is an honor to be here with you today, and as I'm meeting each one of you, I'm really just in awe and extremely grateful for the work that you do, truly. Um, so Jane has highlighted the challenges that communities are already facing from climate change. And as she mentioned, I'd like to flip the coin and focus on how the healthcare sector can mitigate their major contributions to climate change. In order to offset the healthcare sector's carbon footprint, I'll give an example with the NHS Scotland's net zero roadmaps. Um, you'll see a picture of one of their hospitals up on the screen right now. And for those who aren't familiar, NHS Scotland is the publicly funded healthcare system of Scotland and is one of the four systems that make up NHS in the UK. As a result of Scotland's ambitious climate goals, the Scottish government requires all of its hospitals to produce a net zero roadmap that sets out how it will transition to net zero emissions by 2040. In contrast to the Kiribati hospitals where air conditioning was an issue, for NHS Scotland, decarbonizing heat is going to be the biggest challenge, whether they're in a remote island like Orkney here or in the middle of a city like Glasgow. So all this to say, the net zero transition needs to be customized to those individual communities. It can't be done in isolation and it requires cross-sector collaboration. So where do we start? Next slide, please. Okay, I wanna pause here. This is a busy slide, um, but I'm gonna walk you through these scopes because I think it's critical to understand for our net zero journey. As Jane noted earlier, the healthcare sector contributes 4.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. In the US, that's even higher at 8.5%, 7% in Australia, 5% in the UK. And these emissions stem directly from the operations of healthcare facilities, scope one, indirectly from purchase sources of energy, heating and cooling, scope two, and indirectly from supply chain of healthcare goods and services, scope three. Many healthcare organizations around the world are already tackling scope one and two, the operational emissions, but oftentimes those only make up 20% of the operational emissions for a hospital. Um, oftentimes the biggest offender and sometimes making up more than 80% of those total emissions is scope three, those supply chain emissions. So it's important to tackle all three scopes to fully understand the value chain of emissions and set targets. Here I need to point out that not all reduction targets are created equal. We hear about this country going net zero by 2050 or this healthcare system pledging carbon neutrality by 2025, but what does that actually mean? 
Um, very simply, if you're going to go carbon neutral, you just need to include those operational emissions of scope one and two. If you're choosing to go net zero, you need to bring scope three into the mix. So let's demystify healthcare's carbon footprint with an example with NHS Scotland. So one of the ways that we support our industry partners on their sustainability journey is through these net zero roadmaps. We know that every country, every entity, every healthcare system is different. So the roadmap will be different, but the process to get there is the same. So first I want to divine, define this carbon footprint boundary. It's a term used in the climate space. So for a healthcare organization, for your net zero roadmap, whatever you're going to include in your boundary, these are emissions that you actually want to quantify and reduce. If you're leaving it out of your boundary, you're not looking to quantify those emissions at this time. You're not looking to reduce those emissions at this time. So let's look at how we worked with NHS Scotland to set their boundaries. Legislation requires NHS Scotland to reach net zero on their operational emissions. So that's just scope one and two. And you see all of those emissions are included in their operational boundary. And as I mentioned previously, a majority of hospitals emissions come from scope three. So NHS Scotland actually went above and beyond and included um, a significant amount of their scope three in their boundary. And over to the right, you can see in red what they left out of scope. So let's briefly talk about why an organization might be reluctant to include more of their scope three in their operational boundary. First, having a lack of direct impact on those emissions. If you don't feel like you can control them, you don't want to include them in your boundary. Second, it uh, can be challenging to extract that source data. So imagine if you're a healthcare organization, you may have hundreds or even thousands of suppliers. So tackling all of scope three up front can be pretty daunting. Over time though, we would want to see more of those out of scope items in red be brought into the operational boundary uh, as more data becomes available because as they say, you can't manage what you don't measure. And lastly, scope three is not regulated in most places. So from a healthcare management perspective, it's hard to switch from a nice to have to a need to have. I know this, this slide is a lot, so the closing statement here is that defining your boundaries are not easy. It takes a lot of time and climate folks and health, uh, public health folks need to work together, speak the same language to come together and define those for health systems so they can go on their net zero journey. Um, and lastly, we all have a role to play. Now that we've had time to marinate on this paradox of the healthcare system being a major contributor to climate change and looked at what it takes to develop that carbon footprint boundary, what can we all do today to help hospitals and healthcare providers decrease their contribution to climate change? I have three takeaways for you today. So if you've just taken your afternoon nap or if you're anticipating lunch, this is all I want you to take out of this. Um, and I'm excited to be continuing the conversation on these takeaways this week and hopefully bringing them into recommendations on Thursday. The first one is to legislators. Continue to pass regulations and mandates for emission reduction. That includes the biggest offender, those scope three supply chain emissions. Number two, this is to the donor community. Continue to direct funding to global health systems, especially low middle income countries so that they can tackle mitigation in addition to adaptation and resilience. And number three, this is to healthcare organizations. Continue to engage your suppliers and other value chain partners in greenhouse gas management and sustainability. By taking steps to get our own house in order, we improve the efficiency for others to do the same. Thank you all so much for allowing us to talk to you today about our solutions. Please come find Jane and I, and we'd love to speak more to you about it, answer your questions, and learn more about what you're all doing in the climate and health space. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jane and Gabriel, for that thought-provoking framework and the case study as well. There's a lot there 
to think about as we head into lunch now. And lunch will be at uh, Ingredients Restaurant, uh, which is just down the hall uh, to your right as you exit the ballroom. And it's buffet style. There's no specific arrangements. So sit where you like, talk, mingle, get to know one another. And like we said, there's a lot to talk about particularly from this morning, and lots more to come this afternoon. So if we can head back into the ballroom at 2 p.m., we are going to be hearing from Trevor Mundell of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who will be speaking on the effects of climate change on malaria, which will be a great introduction to our next panel as well. Bon appétit and see you at 2.